Hello, this is Amy Brown, Director of Events and Education for Trade Press Media Group. Thank you for joining us for today's webcast, Restroom Design Best Practices to Prevent the Spread of Infection. Our presenters today are Ron Ryan and Allie Summerford. Thank you to today's sponsor, Chicago Faucets, for hosting this webcast. Ron is an Executive Vice President and Co-Founder of Oculus Inc. As a licensed architect with more than 30 years experience, he's worked on a broad range of project types for public and private con clients. Allie is the Interior Design Director at Oculus Inc. and she has more than 20 years of interior design experience with an emphasis in management, client relations, specifications, space planning, design presentations, among other areas. Today's webcast, the learning objectives include Discuss the potential for spreading germs in restrooms. Learn how toilet facility design plays an important role in infection control. And review how product selection can help mitigate the spread of infection. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few details about today's event. A live question and answer session will follow today's presentation. To submit, submit questions, please navigate the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and type in your questions. Our presenters will answer as many questions as possible. At the conclusion of today's webcast, you'll receive a PDF copy to today's presentation slides. You'll also receive a link to a brief online assessment. Upon successful completion of this assessment, you'll receive your CEU certificate. Today's webcast will also be archived at facilitiesnet.com slash webcasts. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Ron. Thanks, Amy. Um, today we're going to be talking about restrooms, and it's a it's a topic that, um, under some circumstances, wouldn't probably be that um, that concerning to a lot of people. But you know, every building has one, and what we're finding, and it's amplified in this COVID nineteen um, pandemic, is that the restroom is one of those places that's now getting some really special. Um, attention to detail. And there are a lot of issues there. For one thing, it's the place in the building that almost everybody will visit at some point, whether it's in an office environment or a hospital or um, any other kind of facility, a school. Um, it is the single point that most people at some point will likely cross paths, even if not in the moment, um, through their contacts and touches on the surfaces and spaces within that restroom. So today we're going to talk about some common restroom trends um, we'll uh, address uh, restrooms and toileting with healthcare facilities and how that also is very similar to senior living facilities. And then we'll talk about the relationship again also with education facilities. Um, on the slide that we have here, I'd just like to point out a couple of, of things to keep in mind as we go forward in today's presentation. So you'll see that in this particular slide on the left, we have some good pieces of design and then some things that we would probably consider today to not be so good pieces of design. So for example, those lavatory faucets that you see here um, are currently operated manually by raising the lever with your hand. It means you have to touch the lavatory faucet to, um, to get it to work. Now the sinks are made out of stainless steel and the countertops are out of a solid surface so they're easily cleaned but in the mirror view of that restroom you see um, urinals in this men's restrooms and urinals are they present a particularly interesting challenge in restroom design because they're convenient but they are also a source of uh, really um, the need for high housekeeping and sanitization services um, and they're they're somewhat um, not so pleasant when you stop and think about them and how they're used and what happens around them. So uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. On the right hand slide is an example of what I would call a really good solution. The faucets are hands free. The uh, restroom screens around the, uh, the toileting fixtures are suspended from the ceiling, which allows housekeeping to get underneath and clean easily. And there's actually been quite a lot of good thought about not only the design of that space, but also the aesthetics of this space. So next slide. So as we get into this, you know, there's some really, I guess, some, some basic things that we're going to try to touch on today that were already trends that are trending now to be more, probably will be adopted more widely and more quickly. Um, the COVID uh, pandemic has really accelerated some things. So, you know, for example, we want to limit the number of contacts and touches. And so door handles, we want those doors swinging outwards, not inwards, typically into most restrooms, so that you don't have to use your hands to actually open the doors. So you're not grabbing a lever or a handle and pulling it. 
um, that you can use your elbow or some other part of your arm if you need to to get out if the door if there is a door at all. Um, and all of this is around the notion that we really want to try to spread limit the spread of diseases and they come in all kinds of various um, shapes and types of pathogens, whether they're viruses or bacteria. Uh, they're all over the place and it's in these restrooms and in restrooms in general where there's lots of high contact that it's really easy to spread them. So I guess one first piece that we want to on, hit on, on on restroom design is that the air in restrooms are also a dead giveaway for things. So if you go into a restroom and you have odor, it can imply that it hasn't been cleaned sufficiently or that the air that's in that restroom, the very air itself is not being evacuated or, or exhausted out of that restroom. So that's a piece of design that usually um, depends on the basic mechanical systems and the exhaust fan system for that particular restroom. And you want to make sure that there are sufficient air exchanges in that restroom to remove the aerosolized odors and things that are in that space out to someplace else. Because one of the things we've learned at learned with coronavirus is that it's often easily transmitted through aerosolized components, whether that's from our speech or from sneezing or coughing, um, or in the case of a toilet, from the flush of a toilet is the possible, uh, possible um, transmitter of other diseases, whether it's coronavirus or it's norovirus. When you flush that toilet, those virus components or those bacteria are aerosolized and, and put into the air. And we want the air um, removed from that bathroom as quickly as possible so that the next user or the next occupant um, isn't inhaling those components of aerosolized bacteria and, you know, essentially breathing it in. We'll talk a little bit about this restroom here because one of the things you see in this hospitality restroom um, is that it's doing a lot of the right things. It's got hard surface materials that are easily clean. It's got a solid surface countertop. It's got a, you know, a, a, a motion activated lavatory faucet. Um, but there are, there are some concerns about this particular restroom and that it has a lot of tile joints. And those tile joints, if they're not cleaned properly or cleaned properly, can become the source of, um, of mold and bacteria contamination that we really maybe want to take a look at. So next slide. So with, re with relation to fixtures, we, um, we, we spoke just a moment ago about auto toilet, um, auto flushing. One of the things to look at there is with regards to the data and the splash and the plume associated with that. The addition of toilet lids, which are not very prevalent uh, within our society today, can help with that prevention of that plume. Another item is paper towel disposal. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. With re relation to materials, let's pause on that topic. While our focus today is on infection prevention and the spreading of germs, I don't wanna lose sight of aesthetics and restroom design overall. The overall restroom design needs to ensure a positive experience, or if you're incorporating a brand that it relates to that as well. Just as the lobby or entry spaces are the first impression um, to a space in general, the restrooms in all market sectors are equally important and necessary uh, in design. The products we select and how we arrange them in the space creates that experience. This image has a lot of examples in it. First, the stainless steel. Stainless steel is a very highly sanitary, easy to clean material, and is typically the predominant choice in hygiene critical applications such as hospital and healthcare like we're gonna talk about and commercial kitchens. It's non-porous, so bacteria is easy to remove. It's also durable and recyclable. Solid surfaces also are eco-friendly and easily cleaned and sanitized and are very durable. Using the non-porous materials reduces the number of germs your sink or countertop can hold and makes the surface cleaning more efficient. Germs are always a consideration when you're choosing your flooring. As we were talking about, tile grout is highly porous and holds dirt and germs. Designers are starting to opt towards larger tile for floors, reducing the amount of grout needed. 
Other options are looking at eliminating that grout altogether, which include epoxy flooring and if budgets allow terrazzo. Here in this image, the tile that's used on the floor is in larger sections than in the last image, thus reducing some of the grout lines. Maintenance and cleanliness go hand in hand. By far, the most important feature of any restroom when you walk into it is cleanliness. Customers, consumers are all very aware of bathroom germs and they wanna feel safe when they go into those restrooms. They need to look and feel clean. People don't wanna see overflowing trash cans. They don't wanna see dirt or stains in the grout. They don't wanna see water on the floor or hardware that's showing its age. One is more inclined to stay in a restroom to complete their, that adequate time to wash their hands in a clean restroom than wanting to get out of that unsightly space as quickly as possible and rushing through that process. Relating to the cleanliness are hands-free items. In this image, we have a hands-free faucet and a hands-free soap dispenser. That hands-free, again, prevents the contact for tr transmission. With relation to all these restroom trends, there's going to be a balance. Space, materials, hands-free, all comes at a cost. The question will become, will the owners pay for it, or will society, now especially with COVID, demand it? We'll touch on some of that today. So as we consider infection control with our restrooms, the things we're going to really look at is, for example, the number of times you have to touch or contact a surface to take care of the business that you need to do in this restroom. And then once you've actually touched or contacted a surface, um, how you wash your hands and can you exit then the restroom without touching or contacting anything else. Those are really key sequence decisions. So, you know, even things now that uh, were somewhat marginal, like toilet seat covers and some of those other sanitary objects, items, I think you're going to find that they're going to probably achieve a higher priority and consideration by building owners and designers as you move forward. And that now what was just a convenience before is probably going to take on a higher priority as people evaluate, do I feel comfortable in this building? Do I feel safe in this building? Do I feel like I want to go into this facility or building? Um, healthcare associated infections have been a major consideration in the healthcare industry for a long time. Um, they are a source of major cost for the industry. And in fact, in hospitals, one of the, the major issues that they've confronted has been the number of people who become sick just by being in the hospital and transferring that infection um, by being in the hospital. So we've been in the healthcare design industry very attentive to those things as we design hospital spaces and manage and think through these sequences and processes. But I think that thought will actually become much more commonplace in the design of traditional office spaces, um, other public commercial spaces, schools, all of those things are gonna really start to adopt some of these best practices that we've been following in the healthcare industry. So keep in mind that it's just not COVID-19 as, the, as the, uh, the pathogen that we're really trying to stop. As I mentioned earlier, there are noroviruses, there's uh, C. diff, which is another um, trans easily transmitted intestinal virus or, or bacteria that um, is easily communicated in spaces. And so we, we really want to start then to consider at the beginning of the design, things like room shape, size, material choices, selection of proper pressurization and filtration of the air. There's, there's examples of hospitals that were designed where the patient rooms exhausted from a patient room into an, into an interior atrium of the building. Um, and, and later they couldn't understand why the adjacent hospital room on the other wing of the building, they were getting infections in. And what they realized is they really needed to do a much more conscientious and attentive job of getting that air not only evacuated out of the room, but evacuated up and out of the building entirely so that it wasn't cross-contaminating um, other spaces in the building where their air intakes weren't just taking the air back in and then distributing it around. Um, 
we want to always consider things, however, like physical safety. So in certain environments, water on the floor is a major concern. And while, this, while certain materials are very easy to clean, we want to be attentive to that, make sure that they're not becoming slippery and that people would fall, especially in environments where we have um, elder, elder care and elder housing taking place or medical care taking place where people might not be as mobile and they might have infirmities that um, traditional um, restroom spaces might not have to really confront. But even in regular commercial office environments, we're concerned about floors being wet and people slipping all in the, in the entire com you know, combined understanding of infection control. I'll go ahead and go to the next slide, Alan. So when we consider that, we also have to consider accommodating hospital care. And as we design these spaces, both the restrooms and inpatient toilet rooms in the hospital for the patient, as well as the public space toilet rooms for visitors and staff, we always want to be accommodating of how the care is being delivered and focusing the design of those toilet rooms on making it easy for housekeeping to clean those spaces and for the caregivers to deliver the care that they need without cross-contamination, without um, safety issues, um, and to elevate the public awareness that the spaces are clean, that they're sterile, are sanitized, and that infection is a concern, and we're always paying attention to it. The architecture that supports all these are also being, are evolving um, due to changes in our society. So, you know, uh, 20 years ago, we were then starting to really address things about mobility, and, and it, we introduced in, in uh, ADA and accessibility into our designs protocols. Now we're dealing with things such as privacy rights and an ever-increasing size of our, in the, in the healthcare industry, of our patient capacity. It's, it's a fact that in the United States, patients are heavier and larger, um, and that has, has introduced uh, design changes into that mix that require us to do things like bariatric patient lifts that can transport the patient from the patient bed into the patient bathroom for toileting, and for showering. And this requires us to start addressing things that are even as much as structural concerns in the ceilings of patient rooms that have to be thought out in advance um, as we design the changes to this. So, you know, 30 years ago, a, a patient ward might have consisted of 20 multi-patient rooms. Um, and now, as we rethink our society's preferences, we're changing those 20 multi-patient rooms into 20 single patient rooms to accommodate things like extra spaces and clearances, privacy concerns, um, larger toilet rooms to, to be able to move bariatric patients in and out and to address accessibility, and to provide uh, staff with sufficient clearances and, and to be able to take care of their patients with safety for both the patient and for the caregiver. Next slide, please. So as we've talked about materials, again, in the healthcare environment, materials have to be robust to prevent that infection and the spread of germs. But we also want materials in a hospital restroom to have that less institutional feeling. In healthcare, as in other markets, we look towards hospitality design for that guidance of that feeling. We still need to maintain durability and cleanability. Our materials, though, have come a long way, and we have a lot more options available now. With regards to antimicrobial, silver and copper have been shown to provide antimicrobial properties. We started to see these utilized in countertops. We started to see uh, silver weaved into privacy curtains. There are also additives that can be at, uh, assist in the preventing of growth in bacteria that can be added to resin and solid surface countertops. As we mentioned costs before, infections cost hospitals billions of dollars. That strategic spending on materials up front can assist in the reductions of the rest revenue lost on the other side. Ron, I'll let you talk about toilet seats and bedpans. Yeah, so, you know, one of the protocols in hospitals is frequently that a patient will have to toilet on the, on the bed and the staff will need to then clean the bedpan out in the patient toilet. Um, one thing that may not be, you know, most of us probably don't think that when we go to the bathroom in a commercial toilet, we're not used to seeing toilet seat covers on those toilets. And I think that might be something that the COVID-19 and norovirus um, 
pandemic for the COVID-19 and, and spot epidemics for norovirus might, might change our thinking about because um, there's actually an, a lot of studies that have been done over the last so five to six years studying how the water in the toilet flush is aerosolized from the churn of that water and what the shape of the toilet actually does to the water um, all the way down to then how, how effective a rather inexpensive toilet seat cover is in preventing the escape of that aerosolized toilet flume from getting up into the air. And it's not something we probably want to think about, but it's a very real concern that if there's an infectious disease pathogen in that, that plume, that we might be essentially spreading that plume around in the room where those things then drift and settle down on surfaces and, and essentially spread the disease around within the patient room itself or from visitors. Um, and so this is becoming a major concern if you, and manufacturers are becoming quite aware of what the shape of the toilet does and how the flush works so that they can maximize the ability for the toilet to flush while minimizing the ability or the, the, the toilet from aerosolizing what's in that flush out into the air. And a toilet seat cover seems like a fairly inexpensive and, and low tech item can really be tremendously effective in reducing um, the toilet plume that is now known to be created every time a toilet is flushed. So especially when staff are having to clean bedpans and flush the waste down the toilet, we want them to have the ability to then close the lid, flush the toilet, and essentially not become contaminated themselves um, with, the, with that toilet plume. Go ahead and the next slide, please. So another thing that as we've been looking at our toilet and restroom designs um, that we're looking at is, especially now during the, the coronavirus pandemic, is um, more than just touches and contacts, but it's then the, the interaction and the, and the crossing points of the people within the restroom. So we provide this restroom. It's a fairly large commercial restroom layout conceptual design here that shows addressing things that we've all become aware of. So accessibility for accessible um, users. Um, it accommodates the diaper changing station in it, but it starts to do some things that I think are going to really become much more predominant in restroom design throughout almost all industries. So for starters, it eliminates the door because if you eliminate the door, then you eliminate the need to either press on a door to open it or pull a handle to open it. Um, either going in or coming out. So in this restroom design, it allows you to enter the restroom, um, take care of what you need to take care of, come over to the sinks, wash your hands, and ideally all the, all the components, the sink, the toilet, the urinal, the paper towel dispenser, the soap dispenser, all of those things um, do not require your hands to contact it. And that way you can come in and you can wash your hands, you can leave the restroom and have never touched a surface once um, you've washed your hands and dried your hands. Now there are some considerations about any of these things, but I would encourage um, you to start thinking holistically about this. So, you know, and, and Allie touched on maintenance and housekeeping a little bit. I'll deal with it on a, on a longer scale basis. So uh, the hands-free devices that are in these bathrooms require the changing of batteries, then there's always a human, um, the possibility for human breakdown in this maintenance process that the batteries don't get changed and the equipment fails. And then you have people not washing their hands. So I would encourage people to really consider if you're designing new restrooms to put power to those locations and to coordinate power with the mechanical, the electrical engineer for those devices so that you remove that human component from it. And that's true of the plumbing fixtures as well. If there's power delivered to those. Retrofit situations will allow for battery operated um, hands-free devices, but they do have the, the need for, for battery changing. We talked earlier about housekeeping issues and I'll, and I'll just touch on um, in this men's restroom here that we have urinals that again, hopefully have hands-free um, flushing devices, but urinals are a particular challenge for housekeeping because the shape of the urinal design the privacy screens, those things are really crucial to um, preventing the amount of splatter, if you will. Um, I know this is probably not a pleasant topic, but you know, you have a busy restroom, you have people using it. The, the amount of splatter from that urinal is actually quite predominant. And if you take a look at the studies around it, 
um, you might, we might really be rethinking whether or not we even want urinals in restrooms. Um, there's parts of the world where that is a, a much higher concern. It doesn't seem to be um, in the United States yet, but I suspect that it will become a consideration as we become much more sensitive to the spread of infection in these restrooms. Um, I will point out that in this restroom, we've also have directional arrows. I suspect that there will be strong encouragement. We see this a lot in airport restrooms, but I think it will be predominant in commercial office restrooms and school restrooms that there will be real guidance in in and out from one side and out the other side without with by trying to eliminate cross traffic and contact points and another concern is providing capacity of the restroom so that you don't have a lot of people waiting for a toilet so i think we've all probably had the experience in airports that were really busy at peak times that we were waiting for a fixture to open up um, i think that as we consider coronavirus and the pandemic, we know that stay, keeping our distance, um, keeping the, the total number of occupants in a room down, having the right evacuation and exhaust in that are really crucial to preventing the spread of infection. And as I said earlier, everybody at some point probably has to cross an, at the restroom point. So we want the capacity and the size and the air changes to be sufficient to really reduce the risk to other people who are going into the restroom. And I would say, you know, again, smell is one of those predictors that if you're getting odors in a restroom, it probably is telling you that that restroom has some faulty design things taking place. Next slide, please. So senior living restrooms are in many ways, um, they go from being almost residential in nature in assisted living centers to very healthcare like in skilled nursing facilities. And we've seen during the pandemic um, that you know, senior living facilities have become uh, real touch points in considering how infections have been spread and transmitted um, it, in our elder care facilities. So I would say we really need to take a special look at it. Um, certainly at the, at the assisted living side of things, the goal is more to try to make the facility seem residential or appear comfortable like a residential home environment would. But we still need to pay special attention to material selections, design, exhaust, all of those things. Now moving up the scale into um, senior living where there's much more, much higher degrees of, of care, then it becomes much more like a true healthcare environment. And, all of those things become very, very big considerations. Um, Allie can talk about that uh, a little more. Yes, so similar to hospital rooms, the location of the toilet room in senior, senior living facilities is crucial. That patient needs to be able to clearly travel from their bed to use the toilet. Again, risk uh, mitigating risk of falls. The toilet uh, in this image you can't see is off to the right, but let's talk about the floor. So here you can clearly see that there's not a trip barrier um, or a hazard. You can see the walls are easily cleaned hard surfaces. They have a slip resist resistant texture. You've got grab bars all around for safety. You have a movable shower head that allows for washing immobile patients as well as elderly. You also have a lot of space. There's ample space here for wheelchairs. There's also space here to have staff assist if needed those residents. Privacy as well is maintained here by providing an operable curtain shower rod. The curtain's obviously not shown, but that doesn't hinder the access overall. Ron, did you want to touch on some of the architectural components? Sure, so in a new, in a new facility, um, making sure that you have sufficient slope to get the water to drain to the drain, while at the same time not having uh, any kind of change in elevation for a barrier that would, that would um, create a trip hazard is really important. And it's actually a much more complicated detail on the architectural side to accomplish um, than you might think. And in a new facility, it, it's far more easily facilitated. In an existing facility that's being renovated, this is still the goal, but it comes a, becomes a much bigger challenge to um, do that while you're getting the proper drainage on that plumbing drain in the center of that shower while not having the trip hazard. And the last thing you want is you don't want the water coming back out into the space 
which is where you might be transitioning um, a patient or an occupant and the floor would be slippery for either the caregiver or for the, the patient or the resident themselves. That's, um, you know, that's a really big important thing to coordinate and it's a really very complicated detail to work out, but pay special attention to it as you're designing um, these types of facilities. Next slide. So as we get into educational facilities, um, you know, a lot of the same concerns are amplified here that we would have when considering either commercial restrooms or healthcare restrooms. But here we're dealing with a population, depending on the age, they could be, um, so let's say elementary school kids. And elementary school kids, it's notorious, um, are their, their little infection vectors for the most part. You know, sniffy, runny nodes, noses, um, colds and flu, they're really common in the, in the, uh, you know, the school environment and we really need to pay special attention. So this is an example of a school restroom. You notice that the surfaces around this door are hard surface so they can be easily cleaned. The floor is an inexpensive but easily clean sealed concrete in this particular instance. Um, the, the kids can get in and out of this restroom without touching doors or opening doors. Um, so our goal is always lower transmission through better design if we can. And that means reducing contact points. Um, you know, kids are often asymptomatic carriers of not only COVID, but of all kinds of other infectious diseases. So we really want to give school restrooms some deep consideration in how the design um, is worked through. Um, but schools also present a, a really unique challenge um, regarding durability. And I think Allie's going to talk about like some material selections and those types of things in schools. So one thing I do want to note before I change to the next slide is here is another example um, in education of not having a door and still allows the privacy and allows the flow uh, into that space. So again, with regards to durability and cleaning and maintenance, uh, just like in healthcare, keeping housekeeping and janitorial services in mind is extremely important. Janitors and housekeeping are going to use what they have available and they're gonna keep it to as few items as possible. We need to make sure as designers and architects that the materials stand up to those harsh cleaning agents used. We want to understand the manufacturer's warranty, but we also want to understand how it's going to perform when other agents are used. In healthcare especially, cabby wipes are used on everything, regardless of whether or not they're supposed to be, you know that they're going to be. So you're going to want to know what the how those materials are going to hold up to using those cabbie wipes over a long period of time. Just like a lot of us are noticing now um, with our skin on our hands that we need to have them moisturized more because of drying out from all the agents in the soap, we need to understand how the materials that we're specifying are going to break down from the more frequent cleaning that's going to be done as a result of this pandemic. Again, just to note, as I mentioned earlier, poorly maintained restrooms are going to discourage students as well as others in staying in that restroom long enough to wash their hands properly. And that is what's going to help prevent that spread of illness to those close contact environments. So research is really one of the things we like to follow at Oculus um, to give us guidance in our design. And when we go and start looking at, at how and what to approach about a design problem for restrooms in particular, we do a, a fair amount of looking and seeing it. Well, what, what studies are out there? What are they telling us? How to inform our decisions based on data and facts? So one of the real key uh, research uh, conclusions has been wherever absolutely possible, reduce the number of touch points and contact points. So we've all seen over the last uh, probably 10 years, a big migration away from uh, paper towel dispensers, soap dispensers, and faucets, where you, you had to touch a, a valve 
or work a handle or pull something out to or press something to get it to work. So while that trend continues, that there, that is certainly the, a bedrock of how we would approach any sort of um, design within these restrooms currently. We want everything that we can do to keep from having to touch things, especially once you've washed and dried your hands. Can you leave that restroom without again touching a surface so that you're not um, cross-contaminating surfaces? Um, and then if you're doing that, you're working in these, these hands-free devices into your designs, do you need to coordinate your power requirements with your electrical engineer so that you have electricity delivered to the appropriate places um, to power those and to keep them working without having to have maintenance and housekeeping um, always coming in and changing batteries and checking them for operational status? Um, you know, soap dispensers, everything. So there is still a fair amount of, of discussion around paper towels versus hand dryers. And when you look at the research on paper towels and hand dryers, depending on whether you're looking at it from an environmental perspective or from a sanitization perspective, you really need to probably pay attention to who is paying for that research and where that research is coming from. I would say that hand dryers are a really good way to minimize touch contact. But there's now some concern that, that hand dryers, even the best hand dryers, might allow you to dry your hands without touching a surface, but they might also be the result or result in aerosolizing um, the contaminants that might have not gotten completely washed off of those hands if they've been washed out into the air. So I would consider you know, that in coordination with your mechanical systems design to make sure that if you're using those dryers, that the air around those hand dryers is also being exhausted and evacuated out of the space so that it's also not potentially recontaminating the occupants or the next occupant or the occupant after that. Um, so there's still some debate over the efficacy of air dryers and paper versus paper towels when it comes to this air contamination um, subject. So I would just say, do your homework, do your research, look at those things as you uh, make these consideration, considerations. Um, I would also uh, just mention that, that Allie and I share a client in our work at Oculus that we actually work very closely with their housekeeping staff as we're making material selections because we know they're the ones who are going to have to take care of these materials downstream from us. And if they're going to use certain materials or chemicals or processes on those, the last thing we want them doing is destroying our surface and our beautiful aesthetic right out of the, the box. So we'll take their, their needs and concerns into consideration as we're designing. Um, so next slide. Oh, actually, you were going to speak on um, integration, Allie, with that, that last slide. I'll let you do that. Oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, thanks, Ron. Yeah, just to quickly mention, um, as you were talking, Ron, about, uh, of course, all the touchless items that are out there with regards to the hand dryers. Now we are also seeing the all-in-one, so where you have the water, the faucet, the soap, and the hand dryer all incorporated into one unit so that you're not having to go from one area to another area um, as well. And I would mention about this particular fixture and this, uh, this resident or elementary school use is that there's very few surfaces for or edges for housekeeping to have to clean. It's pretty easy to wipe down. Um, <clears throat> and take care of, and, and that's the kind of things we really like to see in our designs. So in conclusion, um, you know, there are some real consistent touch points here. And that is reduce touch points through hands-free devices wherever possible, including the removal of doors and barriers to get in and out of the restrooms. Consider using toilet seat lids um, in healthcare and commercial restrooms, even where they may not be commonplace today, to help eliminate the spread. Take a closer look at the toilet, toilet fixtures that you might be considering and see if the manufacturers um, have given consideration to the plume and the creation of toilet plume that they create. Um, because all of those uh, thoughtful uh, decisions will essentially contribute downstream from what you're doing to, to make sure that those restrooms are safe and minimize even un, unforeseen infection transfer. Um, Allie? 
Again, we want to look at uh, selecting the right materials. We've talked about um, stainless steel, solid surface, eliminating those grout joints on floors um, overall. Also, again, looking at the proper exhausting and ventilation within those spaces. One item we didn't touch on, Ron, that you might want to touch on are UV, is U, the use of UV lights. Yes, so, um, so we think that one thing that we're probably going to start seeing in the future um, is the use of ultraviolet light systems um, to be a backup or a supplement to physical cleaning. Um, we know that they're being deployed to some extent in operating rooms uh, around the country as a supplemental um, way to kill bacteria and infections. And we think that they will likely, uh, they might become much more deployed in more commercial applications as we become much more sensitive to um, the spread of bacteria and pathogens and virus pathogens. This is an ultraviolet light system that doesn't damage materials and surfaces that can be um, turned on when there aren't any occupants in the space that then kill the bacteria um, and, and pathogens that might be residing in there that the cleaning and housekeeping staff um, may not have gotten. And I think that that's a, that offers some real advantages at this point um, to, to be have a second backup, if you will. Um, and again, I'm going to just go back to some really basic things, uh, making sure that your exhaust fan systems are working and that the number of air changes are the right amount um, and that the, the equipment is functioning properly over years of time. Um, you know, and so in that respect, even things like commissioning and recommissioning of spaces is probably really helpful to make sure that you're not contributing to the downstream um, transfer and reinfection of people from microbes that might exist in that space. So. Um, with that, I think we're going to open it up for some questions um, and uh, see where this goes. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have plenty of questions coming in. Just a reminder, you can type in your questions to Ron and Allie through the Q&A link at the bottom of the screen. But we'll get, we'll get started right now. Um, Sometimes, you know, with our current facilities, we might not have the budget to do a complete renovation. Um, what would you suggest as a great starting point to try to affect the restroom design to uh, prevent the spread of infection? Is there some place that people should start if they can't, you know, completely renovate their whole restroom? So I'll start with that. And I think that, you know, on the market, there are a wide variety of hands-free um, fixtures and devices, things from paper towel dispensers to soap dispensers to lavatory faucets that can be introduced into the, um, in a renovation that don't require um, electrical connection. So while you might still need to consider the changing of batteries downstream, you can actually accomplish that pretty easily and cost effectively um, without, um, without major expense, honestly. It doesn't require changing building systems and infrastructure. Um, so I would, I would strongly encourage that building and users and occupants um, consider those things. And then um, it comes down to material choices. I'll let Allie speak to that to some extent. Yeah, I think in, re in retrofit situations, um, a lot of times you have to look at where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck um, from an aesthetic standpoint, as well as obviously as we're speaking and in infection prevention and the spread of infections overall need to look at, um, are there, is there any damage in your existing space that needs to be addressed? Uh, was, you know, did poor material choices in the first place um, need to be addressed as far as countertops? Looking at that transfer as far as when you're drying your hands, where is that occurring? Is there water occurring on their floor? Are there grout joints again that need to be cleaned better or eliminated completely? Um, those are kind of some of the material things. I think, you know, one of the items that we haven't really talked about uh, very much in any of these conversations, especially with relationship to multi-stall restrooms, is are the toilet partitions themselves. We spoke a lot of a little bit with relationship to urinals, but we didn't talk about it in toilet partitions except at the very beginning and having them more um, hung from the ceiling to help with the cleaning. But that material, everybody has to touch that handle as well on that toilet partition. So looking at in this image uh, on the right, 
making sure that the door swings from those uh, individual stalls uh, for the fixtures swings outward so that uh, we can help eliminate after you've util use, utilized that fixture to go wash your hands um, as part of it, as well as to the doors themselves. Anything you want to add there, Ron? Yeah, so I would, it's, we're on a slide now at the end where, where it shows a, the men's and women's restroom. And I would mention that, you know, this is a pretty common um, commercial restroom situation where we have restrooms that are, are trying to be packed in pretty tightly in space. And both of these restrooms require you to push the restroom door in and pull the door open on your way out. If I were rethinking some of these things, I would say, you know, you might not have space to do that in, in a retrofit situation. But in this particular instance, that's a point when you're in the restroom, you've washed your hands, you've dried your hands to come back out, you've got to touch the handle to pull the door open. That's someplace that if I could change that door swing in a renovation, I would really seriously consider it. Um, I might not have room for it, um, but that's a point where you're probably asking people to make that transfer and to, um, you know, there's, there's touch point there. So if the guy before didn't wash his hands very well and he's opening the door, um, the next person comes along, even though they washed their hand really well, um, your hand washing scheme might have broken down at that, at that point. Great, thank you. We've had uh, quite a few questions regarding the toilet lids that you guys were mentioning throughout the presentation. And a few people just had comments about, you know, doesn't that create another touch point? And how do you, you know, are there automated uh, toilet lids? And, and can you talk a little bit about, you know, if the, the additional touch point, how you handle that situation? Yes, well, I would say that it's not a perfect solution, um, and depending on the situation, um, especially if it's um, in a healthcare environment, oftentimes the healthcare folks that would be using those lids uh, will be wearing gloves. Um, so that's a little different situation, but the lid can really be an effective tool there. In a commercial environment, it becomes a bit more questionable, but there are automated lids. Um, I know of at least one manufacturer that I don't want to do a, a manufacturer plug that has automated lids for their, for their toilet seats. Um, over heavy commercial use, I might have concern that they would become um, inoperable, but I think it's something that as we go forward, We'll have to just evaluate what the priorities are and consider it. Um, again, exhausting the proper amount of air out of that room might be helpful to that. Um, and there may not be one size and one solution that is perfect for every situation. Great. And talking about the ventilation, like you just mentioned, is there a recommended rate for a bathroom for commercial bathrooms or um, um, anything else that you want to touch on for ventilation? There is a number of uh, air changes um, that's required in the building code. And then rather than quote that um, from memory, I'll let that be a question that we can do a follow up on. Sure. I will say that um, one thing that we've seen doing renovation work is that frequently um, building maintenance teams will not pay a whole lot of attention to how um, group systems for multi-floor office buildings um, have been maintained over years. So what we find is that frequently um, while a, a space might have had the proper air changes and evacuation in the beginning, over time that, that equipment has, has essentially broken down or been modified and doesn't ac actually work as well as it should. So you might really want to come back in and just do some measurements and readjust those pieces of equipment, make sure that filters are changed, make sure that um, equipment is functioning properly and that the ducting systems have been cleaned so that you're getting the proper air flows through them. Um, because what we see is that neglect, um, it's out of sight and out of mind, is often one of the ways that the exhaust breaks down in facilities. And um, it can re it's really not a complicated thing, but it really just needs to be followed up on. Great. Somebody had a question with um, doorless restrooms. Is there a concern about odors coming out of that restroom and, and what you do to manage that process? Um, so I guess, you know, in, in healthcare, we're pretty familiar with making sure that there's the right pressurization of various rooms. So we, we track which way infection might be flowing. So if you have a patient, for example, um, who's really in a compromised situation, we don't want air 
coming into that room. We want air getting pushed out of that room frequently. Uh, when a patient is infectious themselves and we're worried about the flow of the infection going the other direction, we look at the pressurization the other way. I would say that coming back to the something that I mentioned early is that if you have odor in a restroom, you're probably not evacuating the air out or moving the air through it in the proper direction and in the proper quantities. Um, so if the air is getting pulled out of that restroom and evacuated into a system, the air shouldn't be flowing out that door-free entry um, way in the first place. So that's another part of the coordinated design effort that probably needs to be worked out with the mechanical engineer on a project, um, whether it's a new project or a renovation project, to make sure that um, systems aren't, um, you know, essentially overriding each other. Agreed. I think to add to that, uh, also the right material choices, again, um, you know, the elimination of grout or less grout lines, and just a, the cleaning protocol for the housekeeping and janitorial services will all assist in the reduction of any odors. Great. Can you talk a little bit more about um, which metals are the best to control spreading infection? I know you mentioned stainless steel. Or, um, this individual is talking about brass or copper. Um, are, are those good options as well? Yes, copper is has been shown to have antimicrobial material um, or, uh, within it. Um, it is also expensive, as many of us know, um, so it has not been adopted as frequently uh, within designs um, as could be, um, just because of the cost factor there. But copper as well as stainless do have uh, allow that. Great. I think right now we're seeing a lot of products kind of come online or we're seeing them advertised, you know, things like areas you can add to the, the bottom where you can open doors with feet, by your feet as opposed to hands, um, and hand-free operation. Is there anything that you've, either of you have seen um, come out recently that you would think might be of interest for, for the audience? Well, certainly if you could have a door operated and it's safe, um, without a hand, you know, by not touching it, I would say that that's a good solution. And especially if you don't have to consume the physical amount of real estate and space within a building to make that accomplishable, I would say that's something to seriously consider. Um, I do think that one of the things we're going to be looking at, especially in commercial office restrooms and in public restrooms, um, in bigger institutional applications, whether that's university settings, um, school settings, high schools, are that we're likely going to see the demand for the real estate, the square footage increase. And, you know, building owners and developers, um, they know that their capital investment to build and design these things really is often directly related to the square footage. And restrooms aren't typically leasable area. Um, and so if you're adding square footage to buildings to accommodate restrooms, I think that the designers will often come into a conflict um, over various priorities. Uh, so the sensitivity to minimizing uh, infection transmission by increasing square footage could be, become a, a, a really a serious discussion point between developers and building owners and the design team because there, there's potentially some disagreement there which priorities should take precedent. I think in the COVID pandemic, um, we're seeing that our awareness and sensitivity to these things has been elevated. I think the, the possibilities of transmission of infection have always been there. Uh, we're just now a lot more sensitive to it. And especially in this case where we've got a novel virus that none of us have in immunity to, and there really is no treatment for at this, at this point in time, um, it heightens our awareness. And what we want to do is we want to get back to a usual life, um, going to work, being able to socialize with the people that we work with and, and at, at, you know, social establishments at bars and restaurants, and we want to make them as safe as possible. So we're going to be a lot, a lot more sensitive to these things that we can do to minimize the risks as we go back um, really into public life uh, to the extent we can. Um, but I mean, you know, cost is always consideration in design. So we look at the things we can do and get the, as Ali mentioned, the most bang for the buck. Um, even if it means, you know, mopping the floor, 
um, and keeping it clean and fewer joints. So in this case, and the slide is up, we have a concrete floor that's been sealed. It's actually quite effective in being able to be easily maintained and it's pretty low cost. Um, so I would, I would just keep those things in mind to like, you know, you don't have to compromise your design aesthetic um, given the choices of materials and products we have now. I think that there's lots of really good choices out there. One other thing I wanted to add, we've been talking a lot about touchless um, and reducing the touch factor overall. There, as a woman, uh, we usually tend to go into the restroom with stuff. You know, we have a bag or a purse and um, sometimes, you know, we'll have a drink um, or something. Where does all of that go when you go into the restroom? I think the addition of more handles and hooks, either in, you know, as, as close relationship to the sink as possible, or ledges needs to be better incorporated into restroom design overall so that those items are away from any areas uh, of spreading the germs and not having to be placed on the floor as well. And I would say that's in particular a concern or interest of mine um, as somebody who used to travel a lot, haven't of, in the last couple of months, but um, going into a public restroom at an airport and seeing the floor at a men's urinal um, completely covered and thinking, uh, boy, I'm not sure I, I really want to have my suitcase sitting there um, in anywhere close to that. And then seeing people who are also struggling with the, what do you do inside the toilet stall with your briefcase or your luggage and is there enough room for it to be away from where you're at and you know is there the chance that it could get um, contaminated and then you roll out with your bag and go tracing through the airport um, are all concerns yeah great we had a few questions um, that are talking about cdc guidelines regarding urinals and sinks um, and some kind of partition between those have you seen that in place or is there anything people can add, you know, easily or cost effectively to, uh, to handle that kind of requirement from the CD, a recommendation from the CDC? Well, I don't personally know of CDC guidelines. There may, they may be out there. I, I have not specifically gone looking for them since the pandemic started. Um, I do know that, that providing sufficient room around urinals and providing, um, screens that are probably a little deeper than the minimum size, at least that would be my preference as a designer um, to consider those things. Um, and remember that a lot of the standards are just that, they're standards, but they're also minimum standards. So if you can usually exceed those minimum standards, you're likely not making things worse, you're making things better. So if you make that toilet, that, that urinal privacy screen deeper, um, you, you probably start to eliminate a good deal of that cross splatter from one person to the next. I do uh, and am always concerned about the, what's going on on the floor beneath those things. And I know that there are some fixtures um, that are better at that, that, that the shape of the, of the fixture itself is actually better designed and minimizes that. Um, and others aren't. So I would, I would encourage you to talk to your mechanical engineer, whoever is selecting your fixtures, um, to pay attention to that and see if there's any data relative to it because um, it, it's something that's easily measured um, and maybe somebody should write some papers on this particularly if there isn't. I haven't seen one myself personally, but that's a, that would be a consideration. Yeah, I think to add to that, I think sinks are uh, probably a bigger challenge when it comes to adding physical barriers as in this image here on the right. The, you know, in multi-cell restrooms, you typically have one long counter surface as well as an airport that has all of your sinks lined up with as minimal space uh, in between those as possible. As far as providing a physical barrier between those, no, I think more of those are coming. I think uh, in the interim for uh, people to open back up right now, uh, in whatever phase they're in, in their local area. I think there are people who are, you know, using um, items such as plexiglass uh, to create that separation. Now, is that aesthetically pleasing? Not really. Um, however, it is helping to provide some of that spacing. So I think we're going to continue to see more 
items such as uh, to provide those barriers that will meet some of the spacing requirements that can um, that are being uh, requested, as well as be more aesthetically pleasing overall. Perfect. One question was regarding what type of ceilings do you recommend in restrooms? It's one of the surfaces we didn't really talk about very much yet. Yeah, so I, this is, I would really consider um, a hard type of deck ceiling for a couple reasons. Mechanical engineers like it because it helps them manage the airflow and the exhaust situation. But it also provides a surface that can be cleaned should it need to be. Um, and I would, I would say that that's uh, been a preference of mine as an architect and a designer for a large portion of my career. Um, it, it helps with any number of things, but I mean, so a drywall ceiling, um, a harder surface lay-in ceiling that has cleanable surface materials. Um, I think those are they're, those are much preferred versus porous surfaces, um, especially if you consider that you know you might have some of that aerosolized plume in the air being absorbed by mineral fiber or fibrous materials. We don't know how long some of that stuff lives. Um, I don't think it's a it's certainly an item not touching the ceiling frequently, but. Um, the, the more clean ability that you can give inside a restroom, I think, is the better, um, especially in the higher traffic, more commercial restrooms. I would completely agree with that. Uh, I would highly recommend a hard surface on the ceiling as well. Um, again, as we talked about, elimination of any of those joints um, or spaces, especially with a grid and a lay-in ceiling, um, and then the easy, uh, easier cleanability of that surface. Great. One of our uh, viewers just wrote in that uh, for ed education facilities, uh, the schools like to have doorless restrooms so that for security purposes as well, which I just thought was a good point to bring up uh, regarding a different topic, but another good thought for yeah. education facilities. Finally, I'd like to just get your uh, kind of viewpoint. We've got two questions, one just for future of restroom design. Uh, one person just wanted to get your viewpoints on, do you think we'll see more unisex uh, bathrooms in the future in the United States? And then the second was, uh, what about removing the hand washing outside of the bathroom, or outside of the restroom? So just those two points, if you could give your viewpoint on where you see the future. Yeah, so I do think that, especially in schools, one of the things that we're looking at um, are not only um, unisex bathrooms per se, is that the subject of, uh, of gender sensitivity and awareness has become a much higher level of thought and concern by school administrations. So I think what we're going to see is as our culture evolves in that direction and our best practices and notions around that evolve, design of restrooms and the introduction of unisex bathrooms or general bathrooms are gonna become much more commonplace. I, I don't know if I can predict the future about where that's going to go. I think it's going to be culturally um, driven by a community typically, um, and you're gonna see some differences, but I do think that there's gonna be an awareness around um, gender issues, especially regarding school bathrooms, and they're gonna lead this decision-making front probably for, for the next um, foreseeable future. And then whatever occurs there um, at the say elementary, middle school and high school level, will likely then start to telegraph through the rest of society and college and universities and the commercial facilities as people um, become accustomed to them. This is really an area that has evolved and changed quite a lot um, in my years of practice. There's a lot of different thinking about that particular subject. And um, I think it's something that designers are gonna really need to pay um, special attention to. Um, and if you could continue, what was the rest of this question? I, I'm sure it's, do you think there would be a trend to move the hand washing outside of the restroom? Um, I, I think that that's a possibility. Um, there's a restaurant that, um, I used to go to and I, it's just now probably reopened that had the toileting inside the facility and then the sinks and hand washing was outside. And I actually thought, that it was quite a successful idea. It gave people the opportunity to wash their hands without even going into the restroom. And it didn't, um, it didn't reduce, um, you know, the, I, or increase the potential for infection transfer, I didn't think. 
um, at all. Um, now that I'm, I'm paying a special attention to it, I wouldn't mind going back and looking at the sequence of, of processes um, from a, I'll call it from a, a forensic level to analyze if I touch this, touch this, go to there, do this, if I, if I have really, if I like the idea, but I, I, I think it's probably a workable viable consideration. I would agree. I think um, to add on to Ron's point, uh, education, uh, I think, has really been leading this um, effort moving forward. The You have already are seeing uh, the sinks outside of the restrooms, uh, especially in K, K through 12 areas. Um, the other thing I wanted to add is on the other end of the spectrum that I think we're seeing a trend towards as well. Um, you will see your family restrooms in various uh, market sectors, but I think they're being looked at uh, from a different perspective. Other than a family, which is traditionally looked at as far as a mother or a father with children, you're also looking at our older generation and who those caregivers are. So you may have a father who needs to use the restroom, but his daughter is the one who needs to assist him with that or vice versa um, on the gen associated with the genders there. So I think that that's a consideration that needs to be taken um, uh, as well. Wonderful, thank you very much. We just received a note from one of our attendees that they just renovated their entire restroom stack and their higher education facility to be gender neutral and they've been very successful. Um, they don't have any urinals, they're all private stalls with a toilet and communal sinks. It is making its way through some of the education facilities, it looks like. Perfect. Well, with that, I know we're, we're over our time today. Uh, thank you very much, Ron and Allie. I wanted to give a final uh, chance if you had any final pieces of wisdom you'd like to share with the audience. No, I do think that, for example, urinals are going to be subject of uh, a lot of consideration going forward um, in restroom design. I'm, I'm not sure that they're a really good plan, even though they're, a, you know, a um, a culturally acceptable thing now. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you both. Again, Ron and Allie are both with Oculus Inc. Um, but we'd also like to thank our sponsor of this webcast, Chicago Faucets. Just a reminder, we will be archiving this at facilitiesnet.com slash webcast. So that'll be up probably within the next 48 to 72 hours. And you'll be receiving a link with a copy of today's slides, as well as a link to take your CEU assessment. So with that, I'll thank you both for participating and thank you for everybody on the call. And we look forward to seeing you at a future webcast. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.